Tracy used her phone to send an email while in the corridor. Jackson inquired if she was still seeking for a local attorney out of concern. Tracy reassured him that she was happy with his job and had no plans to have him replaced. Jackson walked away, and Brooklyn walked over. She gave her grandmother an angry look before leaving silently. In an elevator at General Hospital, Sam and Cody were riding. While Sam acknowledged that she couldn't believe she had agreed to support Cody with his crazy scheme, Cody paced. Cody winked and added, That's what I'm depending on. People thinking I'm insane. Sam agreed that Cody had shown exemplary loyalty to Sasha. Sam thanked Cody for the compliment, but she cautioned him that the plan might go horribly wrong and Cody might find himself in Sasha's shoes. Cody made it apparent that he was prepared to take a chance in order to aid Sasha. Cody gazed at Sam as the elevator doors opened. Showtime, said Cody. Cody and Sam were seated in Dr. Brooks' office a little while later. Sam clarified that she had medical power of attorney over Cody because he was a close family friend. Sam said that she was worried about Cody's unexpected outbursts after Cody grumbled about the appointment. Sam alleged that Cody had been acting out of character and erratically, frequently putting himself in perilous circumstances. The moment the doctor asked for some examples, Cody started to wriggle. Dr. Brooks questioned Cody about why he felt compelled to put himself in risk after Sam portrayed a disturbing image of Cody, irrationally placing himself in life-threatening circumstances. Cody confessed to the physician that he no longer understood the purpose of being alive. Sam was ordered to leave the office by Dr. Brooks, who then inquired as to whether Cody had been considering suicide. Cody claimed to have suicidal impulses and to get a rush from defying death, but the only way to achieve this high was to raise the stakes every time. In addition to admitting to occasionally pondering not releasing the parachute before his jumps, Cody disclosed that he had once worked as a stuntman. Cody explained, because then I wouldn't have to struggle anymore. Cody broke down in tears as he assured the doctor that everything will now be quiet. Cody remarked, everything would just be over. Sam opened the cup's lid to reveal a steaming mug of coffee. Dr. Montague approached as she turned away from the nurse's station, causing her to collide with him. She instantly apologized after spilling her coffee on his blazer and used a napkin to clean it off, as well as the mobile phone he was holding. As he assured Sam that everything was all right, Montague grinned. Sam smirked at the peculiar name of the caller, but Montague let the call go to voicemail and her smile faded when his phone quickly rang, and she saw that the caller was Gladys. Sam questioned Montague why she was at the hospital after giving him back his phone. As she informed him that she had been waiting for a companion, she remained evasive. She admitted, though, that she would have liked to have taken her deck of cards to pass the time. Their passion for poker rapidly came up in discussion. If Sam was interested in playing in one of Monty's poker games, he invited her to give him a call. Sam was informed that Dr. Brooks wanted to speak with her by a nurse after Monte gave her his business card and left the room. Sam afterwards put her signature on the documents to allow Cody to enroll at Ferncliff. She cautioned Cody subtly that there would be repercussions if his scheme backfired and injured Sasha. Sam vowed, I'll kill you. A short while afterwards, a steward brought Cody away. While everything was going on, Dante greeted the receptionist at Ferncliff by displaying his badge. He claimed that he had been to Metro Court's pool to speak with Sasha about the stabbing. Dante entered Sasha's room after receiving permission, but Janet stopped him. Dante briskly introduced himself as a detective with additional inquiries on the stabbing. Dante was informed by Janet about Sasha's setback and their assumption that Sasha had found a narcotic smuggler. Janet reassured Dante that they had taken action to halt it, but Don made the decision to personally check on Sasha. Dante went into Sasha's room after Janet left. Sasha was sound asleep while being restrained to the bed. Sasha didn't awaken even after Don gently shook her shoulder and yelled out her name. Janet entered the space after Dante left to check Sasha's vital signs. Sasha awoke out of nowhere and seized Janet's wrist. Please, Janet, 
Don't let Dr. Montague near me, Sasha bade. Janet questioned why, alarmed. Sasha admitted Hello, that the everyone, doctor had given And her. welcome to my General Hospital official channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. The case filed by Tracy is approved to proceed. Lucy imagined Tracy was there the courtroom to support deception. Actually, Tracy said, I'm here to defend my legal claim against the deceptor. Lucy chuckled because she believed Tracy was making fun of her. Maxie pointed out to Tracy that Lucy had invented the deceptor and that Tracy had no legal right to the well-known cosmetic item as Brooklyn frowned at her grandma. Why Tracy would take action against deception shocked Lucy. This is about my relationship with your brother. May he rest in peace, Lucy remarked startledly. Tracy charged, you had a cheap and sleazy affair with Alan while he was married to Monica. Because several of Tracy's ex-husbands had connections to organized crime, Lucy contended that Tracy was not in a position to claim the moral high ground. Maxie cautioned Lucy to stay in the moment and figure out how to get Tracy's false lawsuit dismissed before things got out of hand. Everyone took their places before Judge Kerr entered the courtroom. At the defense table, Lucy was seated with Elise Vance, while Tracy sat next to Jackson Montgomery. Both Brooke Lynn and Maxie sat in the audience. Jackson told the judge that he had verifiable evidence, such as blueprints and schematics of the original design, that his client's intellectual property had been stolen when Judge Kerr allowed Jackson to present his case. Jackson disclosed that he had expert witnesses that could attest to the similarities between his client's original concept and Deception's product. Finally, Jackson disclosed to the court his intention to file a claim for damages. Elise claimed that she hadn't been given the chance to examine Jackson's testimony when Judge Kerr questioned her she had a reaction. Illis argued that the lawsuit was frivolous and was intended to get Deception to offer a settlement in order to avert an expensive court battle. Elise was reminded by the judge that this was only a preliminary hearing and that if the matter went to trial, she would have plenty of time to review the evidence. While he examined the evidence presented by Jackson, Judge Kerr summoned both counsel to come to the bench. A short while later, Judge Kerr declared that Jackson had offered sufficient proof to support holding a trial. Judge Kerr stated, I scheduled the trial to start six months from today. Lucy questioned Elise about what had happened after the judge had left the courtroom. Lucy said that waiting six months for a trial was unreasonable because deception would be rendered useless by that time. Brooke Lynn was nearby when Maxie gave her the reassurance that Elise would be able to get the lawsuit dropped due to Jackson's falsified proof. Nearby, Tracy was happy with the judge's decision, but Jackson remarked that there was still much work to be done. Elise reassured Lucy that she would devise a strategy while she was away. Elise responded to Lucy's question by saying that no more sales of the deceptor could be made through deception. Unhappy, Lucy acknowledged that the company's stock had been falling and that it would shortly file for bankruptcy. Trissy calmly explained that Lucy had an unusual capacity to draw scandal like a magnet, and Lucy stormed over accusing Tracy of creating proof and malicious harassment. Tracy pointed out that Lucy's most recent offense was stealing intellectual property and that Coco Cosmetics had essentially been a Ponzi scheme. Tracy, though, made a proposal to end the lawsuit. Lucy demanded to know what Tracy wanted out of frustration. 75% of deception, Tracy remarked. Although Tracy forewarned Lucy that if she lost the lawsuit, 25% was still better than nothing. Lucy was upset. Jackson halted in the doorway as Tracy and him prepared to depart and asked a list to contact him. Brooke Lynn excused herself after Tracy and Jackson went to speak to her grandma. Because Tracy had been able to obtain the confidential information for the deceptor, Elise expressed her worries to Lucy. Maxie acknowledged that Lucy didn't need Spinelli's assistance to find the mole despite Lucy's desire. Maxie reminded Lucy that Brooke Lynn had just taken the flash drive home after downloading the Deceptor data onto it. 
Maxie was positive that Brooke Lynn had handed Tracy the data, but she was baffled as to why she had done it. Tracy had definitely extorted Brooke Lynn, according to Lucy. Elise indicated that Brooke Lynn and Tracy had been collaborating in the background right away.